Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. Great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 42. Of Power Ecclesiastical. For the understanding of power ECC SISD CLL, what, and in whom it is, we are to distinguish the time from the ascension of our Savior into two parts. One before the conversion of kings and men endued with sovereign civil power, the other after their conversion. For it was long after the ascension, before any king or civil sovereign embraced and publicly allowed the teaching of Christian religion, of the Holy Spirit that fell on the apostles. And for the time between, it is manifest that the power ecclesiastical was in the apostles. And after them and such as were by them ordained to preach the gospel and to convert men to Christianity, and to direct them that were converted in the way of salvation. And after these the power was delivered again to others by these ordained, and this was done by imposition of hands upon such as were ordained. By which was signified the giving of the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of God, to those whom they ordained ministers of God, to advance his kingdom. So that imposition of hands was nothing else but the seal of their commission to preach Christ and teach his doctrine. And the giving of the Holy Ghost by that ceremony of imposition of hands was an imitation of that which Moses did. For Moses used the same ceremony to his minister Joshua, as we read Deuteronomy 34. Version 9. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him. Our Savior therefore between his resurrection and ascension gave his spirit to the apostles. First, by breathing on them and saying, John 20.22. Receive ye the Holy Spirit, and after his ascension, Acts 2.23, by sending down upon them a mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire. And not by imposition of hands, as neither did God lay his hands on Moses, and his apostles afterward transmitted the same spirit by imposition of hands, as Moses did to Joshua. So that it is manifest hereby, in whom the power ecclesiastical continually remained in those first times, where there was not any Christian commonwealth. Namely, in them that received the same from the apostles, by successive laying on of hands, of the Trinity. Here we have the person of God born now the third time. For as Moses and the high priests were God's representative in the Old Testament, and our Savior himself as man, during his abode on earth. So the Holy Ghost, that is to say, the apostles, and their successors, in the office of preaching and teaching, that had received the Holy Spirit, have represented him ever since. But a person, as I have shown before, chapped. 16. Dot, is he that is represented, as often as he is represented, and therefore God, who has been represented, that is, personated, thrice, may properly enough be said to be three persons. Though neither the word person, nor trinity be ascribed to him in the Bible. St. John indeed, 1 Epist 5.7, saith, There be three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, but this disagreeth not, but accordeth fitly with three persons in the proper signification of persons, which is, that which is represented by another. For so God the Father, as represented by Moses, is one person, and is represented by a son, another person, and is represented by the apostles, and by the doctors that taught by authority from them derived, is a third person. And yet every person here, is the person of one and the same God. But a man may here ask, what it was whereof these three bear witness. St. John therefore tells us, verse 11, that they bear witness, that God hath given us eternal life in his Son. Again, if it should be asked, wherein that testimony appeareth, the answer is easy. For he hath testified the same by the miracles he wrought, first by Moses, secondly, by his son himself, and lastly by his apostles that had received the Holy Spirit. All which in their times represented the person of God, and either prophesied or preached Jesus Christ. And as for the apostles, it was the character of the apostleship, in the twelve first and great apostles, to bear witness of his resurrection, as appeareth expressly, Acts 1. For 21, 22, 
where St. Peter, when a new apostle was to be chosen in the place of Judas Iscariot, useth these words. Of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning at the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection, which words interpret the bearing of witness, mentioned by St. John. There is in the same place mentioned another trinity of witnesses in earth. 4. Ver. 8. He saith, There are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. That is to say, the graces of God's Spirit, and the two sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, which all agree in one testimony, to assure the consciences of believers of eternal life. Of which testimony he saith, verse 10, He that believeth on the Son of Man hath the witness in himself. In this trinity on earth the unity is not of the thing. For the Spirit, the water, and the blood are not the same substance, though they give the same testimony. But in the Trinity of Heaven, the persons are the persons of one and the same God, though represented in three different times and occasions. To conclude, the doctrine of the Trinity, as far as can be gathered directly from the Scripture, is in substance this, that God who is always one and the same, was the person represented by Moses. The person represented by his Son incarnate, and the person represented by the Apostles. As represented by the Apostles, the Holy Spirit by which they spake, is God, is represented by a Son, that was God and man, the Son is that God. As represented by Moses, and the High Priest, the Father, that is to say, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is that God. From whence we may gather the reason why those names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the signification of the Godhead, are never used in the Old Testament. For they are persons, that is, they have their names from representing, which could not be, till diverse men had represented God's person in ruling or in directing under him. Thus we see how the power ecclesiastical was left by our Savior to the apostles, and how they were, to the end they might the better exercise that power, endued with the Holy Spirit, which is therefore called sometime in the New Testament Paracletus which signifieth an assister, or one called to for help, though it be commonly translated a comforter. Let us now consider the power itself, what it was, and over whom. The power ecclesiastical is but the power to teach. Cardinal Bellarmine in his third general controversy hath handled a great many questions concerning the ecclesiastical power of the Pope of Rome. And begins with this, whether it ought to be monarchical, aristocratical, or democratical. All which sorts of power are sovereign and coercive. If now it should appear that there is no coercive power left them by our Savior, but only a power to proclaim the kingdom of Christ and to persuade men to submit themselves thereunto. And by precepts and good counsel, to teach them that have submitted what they are to do, that they may be received into the kingdom of God when it comes. And that the apostles and other ministers of the gospel are our schoolmasters and not our commanders, and their precepts not laws, but wholesome counsels then were all that dispute in vain. An argument thereof, the power of Christ himself. I have shown already, in the last chapter, that the kingdom of Christ is not of this world, therefore neither can his ministers, unless they be kings, require obedience in his name. For if the supreme king have not his reg all power in this world, by what authority can obedience be required to his officers? As my father sent me, so saith our Savior, I send you. But our Savior was sent to persuade the Jews to return to, and to invite the Gentiles, to receive the kingdom of his father and not to reign in majesty, no not, as his father's lieutenant, till the day of judgment. From the name of regeneration. The time between the ascension and the general resurrection is called, not a reigning, but a regeneration. That is, a preparation of men for the second and glorious coming of Christ at the day of judgment, as appeareth by the words of our Savior, Matt. 19.28 You that have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones, and of St. Paul, F's. 6.15 Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. From the comparison of it, with fishing, leaven, seed. And is compared by our Savior, to fishing, that is, to winning men to obedience, not by coercion and punishing. But by persuasion, 
and therefore he said not to his apostles, he would make them so many nimrods, hunters of men, but fishers of men. It is compared also to leaven, to sowing of seed, and to the multiplication of a grain of mustard seed, by all which compulsion is excluded. And consequently there can in that time be no actual reigning. The work of Christ's ministers is evangelization, that is, a proclamation of Christ and a preparation for his second coming. As the evangelization of John Baptist was a preparation to his first coming. From the nature of faith. Again, the office of Christ's ministers in this world is to make men believe and have faith in Christ, but faith hath no relation to, nor dependence at all upon compulsion or commandment, but only upon certainty or probability of arguments drawn from reason or from something men believe already. Therefore the ministers of Christ in this world have no power by that title to punish any man for not believing or for contradicting what they say. They have I say no power by that title of Christ's ministers to punish such. But if they have sovereign civil power, by politic institution, then they may indeed lawfully punish any contradiction to their laws whatsoever. And St. Paul, of himself and other than preachers of the gospel, saith in express words, 2 COR 1.24, We have no dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. From the authority Christ hath left to civil princes. Another argument, that the ministers of Christ in this present world have no right of commanding, may be drawn from the lawful authority which Christ hath left to all princes, as well Christians. As infidels. St. Paul saith, Colonel. 3.20 Children obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. And version 22. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, as fearing the Lord. This is spoken to them whose masters were infidels and yet they are bidden to obey them in all things. And again, concerning obedience to princes. Rom 13, the first six, verses, exhorting to be subject to the higher powers, he saith, that all power is ordained of God. And that we ought to be subject to them, not only for fear of incurring their wrath, but also for conscience sake. And St. Peter, 1 Epist. Chapter 2 E version 13, 14, 15. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, as supreme, or unto governess. As to them that be sent by him for the punishment of evil doers, and for the praise of them that do well, for so is the will of God. And again St. Paul, Tit. 3.1. Put men in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, and to obey magistrates. These princes and powers, whereof St. Peter and St. Paul here speak, were all infidels. Much more therefore we are to obey those Christians whom God hath ordained to have sovereign power over us. How then can we be obliged to do anything contrary to the command of the king or other sovereign representative of the commonwealth whereof we are members and by whom we look to be protected? It is therefore manifest that Christ hath not left to his ministers in this world unless they be also endued with civil authority any authority to command other men. What Christians may do to avoid persecution but what may some object, if a king, or a senate, or other sovereign person forbid us to believe in Christ? To this I answer, that such forbidding is of no effect, because belief and unbelief never follow men's commands. Faith is a gift of God, which man can neither give, nor take away by promise of rewards, or menaces of torture. And if it be further asked, what if we be commanded by our lawful prince, to say with our tongue, we believe not, must we obey such command? Profession with the tongue is but an external thing, and no more than any other gesture whereby we signify our obedience. And wherein a Christian, holding fearmaily in his heart the faith of Christ, hath the same liberty which the prophet Elisha allowed to Naaman the Syrian. Naaman was converted in his heart to the God of Israel, for he saith 2 Kings 5.17, Thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering, nor sacrifice unto other gods but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. This the prophet approved, and bid him go in peace. Here Naaman believed in his heart. But by bowing before the idol Rimmon, he denied the true God in effect, 
as much as if he had done it with his lips. But then what shall we answer to our Savior, saying, Whosoever denieth me before men, I will deny him before my Father which is in heaven? This we may say, that whatsoever a subject, as Naaman was, is compelled to an obedience to his sovereign, and doth it not in order to his own mind, but in order to the laws of his country, that action is not his, but his sovereign's. Nor is it he that in this case denieth Christ before men, but his governor, in the law of his count Ray. If any man shall accuse this doctrine, as repugnant to true, and unfeigned Christianity. I ask him, in case there should be a subject in any Christian commonwealth, that should be inwardly in his heart of the Mahometan religion. Whether if his sovereign command him to be present at the divine service of the Christian church, and that on pain of death. He think that Mammometan obliged in conscience to suffer death for that cause, rather than to obey the command of his lawful prince. If he say, he ought rather to suffer death, then he authorizeth all private men, to disobey their princes, and maintenance of their religion, true or false. If he say, he ought to be obedient, then he alloweth to himself, that which he denieth to another, contrary to the words of our Savior, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you. That do ye unto them and contrary to the law of nature, which is the indubitable everlasting law of God, do not to another, that which thou wouldest not he should do unto thee. Of martyrs. But what then shall we say of all those martyrs we read of in the history of the church, that they have needlessly cast away their lives? For answer he run to, we are to distinguish the persons that have been for that cause put to death, whereof some have received a calling to preach, and profess the kingdom of Christ openly. Others have had no such calling nor more has been required of them than their own faith. The former sort, if they have been put to death, for bearing witness to this point, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, were true martyrs. For a martyr is, to give the true definition of the word, a witness of the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. Which none can be but those that conversed with him on earth, and saw him after he was risen, for a witness must have seen what he testifieth, or else his testimony is not good and that none but such can properly be called martyrs of Christ, is manifest out of the words of St. Peter, Act 1.21-22. Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a martyr, that is a witness, with us of his resurrection. Where we may observe, that he wishes to be a witness of the truth of the resurrection of Christ, that is to say, of the truth of this fundamental article of Christian religion. That Jesus was the Christ, must be some disciple that conversed with him, and saw him before, and after his resurrection, and consequently must be one of his origin all disciples. Whereas they which were not so, can witness no more, but that their ancestors said it, and are therefore but witnesses of other men's testimony and are but second martyrs, or martyrs of Christ's witnesses. He, that to maintain every doctrine which he himself draweth out of the history of our Savior's life, and of the Acts, or Epistles of the Apostles, or which he believeth upon the authority of a private man, will oppose the laws and authority of the civil state, is very far from being a martyr of Christ, or a martyr of his martyrs. Tis one article only, which to die for, meriteth so honorable a name, and that article is this that Jesus is the Christ. That is to say, he that hath redeemed us, and shall come again to give us salvation, and to turn all life in his glorious kingdom. To die for every tenant that serveth the ambition or profit of the clergy is not required. Nor is it the death of the witness, but the testimony itself that makes the martyr. For the word signifieth nothing else, but the man that beareth witness, whether he be put to death for his testimony or not. Also he that is not sent to preach this fundamental article, but taketh it upon him of his private authority, though he be a witness, and consequently a martyr, either primary of Christ, or secondary of his apostles, disciples, or their successors, yet is he not obliged to suffer death for that cause, because being not called thereto, does not require it at his hands. Nor ought he to complain, if he lost set the reward he expecteth from those that never set him on work. None therefore can be a martyr, neither of the first nor second degree, that have not a warrant to preach Christ come in the flesh. That is to say, none, but such as are sent to the conversion of infidels. For no man is a witness to him that already believeth, and therefore needs no witness, but to them that deny, or doubt, 
or have not heard it. Christ sent his apostles and his seventy disciples with authority to preach. He sent not all that believed, and he sent them to unbelievers. I send you, saith he, a sheep amongst wolves. Not a sheep to other sheep. Argument from the points of their commission. Lastly, the points of their commission, as they are expressly set down in the gospel, contain none of them any authority over the congregation. To preach. We have first, Matt. 10. That the twelve apostles were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and commanded to preach that the kingdom of God was at hand. Now preaching in the origin all is that act. Which a crier, herald, or other officer useth to do publicly in proclaiming of a king. But a crier hath not right to command any man. In Luke 10.2, the seventy disciples are sent out as laborers, not as lords of the harvest, and are bidden, verse 9, to say, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. And by kingdom here is meant, not the kingdom of grace, but the kingdom of glory, for they are bidden to denounce it, ver. 11. To those cities which shall not receive them, as a threatening, that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom, than for such a city. And Matt. 20.28. Our Savior telleth his disciples, that sought priority of place, their office was to minister, even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Preachers therefore have not magisterial, but ministerial power. Be not called masters, saith our Savior, Matt. 23.10 For one is your master, even Christ. And teach. Another point of their commission is to teach all nations, as it is in Matt. 28.19 Or as in St. Mark 16.15 Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Teaching therefore, and preaching is the same thing. For they that proclaim the coming of a king, must withal make known by what right he cometh, if they mean men shall submit themselves unto him. As St. Paul did to the Jews of Thessalonica, when three Sabbath days he reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening, and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus is Christ. But to teach out of the Old Testament that Jesus was Christ, that is to say, King, and risen from the dead, is not to say. That men are bound after they believe it, to obey those that tell them so, against the laws and commands of their sovereigns. But that they shall do wisely, to expect the coming of Christ hereafter, in patience and faith, with obedience to their present magistrates. To baptize. Another point of their commission is to baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. What is baptism? Dipping into water. But what is it to dip a man into the water in the name of anything? The meaning of these words of baptism is this. He that is baptized is dipped or washed as a sign of becoming a new man, and a loyal subject to that God, whose person was represented in old time by Moses and the high priests, when he reigned over the Jews. And to Jesus Christ, his Son, God, and man, that hath redeemed us, and shall in his humane nature represent his Father's person in his eternal kingdom after the resurrection. And to acknowledge the doctrine of the apostles, who assisted by the Spirit of the Father and of the Son, were left for guides to bring us into that kingdom, to be the onely, and assured way thereunto. This, being our promise and baptism, and the authority of earthly sovereigns being not to be put down till the day of judgment, for that is expressly affirmed by S. Paul 1 Cor. 15, 22, 23, 24. Where he saith, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then come meth the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, and all authority and power it is manifest. That we do not in baptism constitute over us another authority, by which our external actions are to be governed in this life. But promise to take the doctrine of the apostles for our direction in the way to life eternal. And to forgive and retain sins. The power of remission and retention of sins, called also the power of loosing and binding, and sometimes the keys of the kingdom of heaven, is a consequence of the authority to baptize. Or refuse to baptize. For baptism is the sacrament of allegiance, of them that are to be received into the kingdom of God, that is to say, into eternal life. That is to say, to remission of sin. For as eternal life was lost by the committing, 
so it is recovered by the remitting of men's sins. The end of baptism is remission of sins. And therefore St. Peter, when they that were converted by a sermon on the day of Pentecost, asked what they were to do, advised them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And therefore seeing to baptize is to declare the reception of men into God's kingdom, and to refuse to baptize is to declare their exclusion. It followeth that the power to declare them cast out, or retained in it, was given to the same apostles, and their substitutes, and successors. And therefore after our Savior had breathed upon them, saying, John 20.22, Receive the Holy Ghost, he addeth in the next verse, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. By which words is not granted an authority to forgive, or retain sins, simply and absolutely, as God forgiveth or retaineth them. Who knoweth the heart of man, and truth of his penitence and conversion. But conditionally, to the penitent. And this forgiveness, or absolution, in case the absolved have but a feigned repentance, is thereby without other act, or sentence of the absolvent, made void and hath no effect at all to salvation, but on the contrary, to the aggravation of his sin. Therefore the apostles, and their successors, are to follow but the outward marks of repentance, which appearing, they have no authority to deny absolution. And if they appear not, they have no authority to absolve. The same also is to be observed in baptism, for to a converted Jew, or Gentile, the apostles had not the power to deny baptism, nor to grant it to the unpenitent. But seeing no man is able to discern the truth of another man's repentance, further than by external marks, taken from his words and actions, which are subject to the hypocrisy. Another question will arise, who it is that is constituted judge of those marks? And this question is decided by our Savior himself, Matt. 18, 15, 16, 17. If thy brother, saith he, shall trace passe against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee, and him alone, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one, or two more. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man, and a publican, by which it is manifest, that the judgment concerning the truth of repentance belonged not to any one man, but to the church, that is, to the assembly of the faithful, or to them that have authority to be their represented. But besides the judgment, there is necessary also the pronouncing of sentence, and this belonged always to the apostle or some pastor of the church as prolocutor. And of this our Savior speaketh in the 18 verse, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And comfortable hereunto was the practice of St. Paul, 1 C.O.R. 5.3, 4, and 5, where he saith, For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have determined already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one to Satan. That is to say, to cast him out of the church, as a man whose sins are not forgiven. Paul here pronounced the sentence, but the assembly was first to hear the cause, for St. Paul was absent winky face, and by consequence to condemn him. But in the same chapter, ver. 11, 12, the judgment in such a case is more expressly attributed to the assembly. But now I have written unto you, not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, etc. With such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not you judge them that are within. The sentence therefore by which a man was put out of the church was pronounced by the apostle or pastor. But the judgment concerning the merit of the cause was in the church. That is to say, as the times were before the conversion of kings, and men that had sovereign authority in the commonwealth, the assembly of the Christians dwelling in the same city. As in Corinth, in the assembly of the Christians of Corinth. Of excommunication. This part of the power of the keys, by which men were thrust out from the kingdom of God, is that which is called excommunication. And to excommunicate is in the origin all, Aposynagogon poion, to cast out of the synagogue, that is, out of the place of divine service. A word drawn from the custom of the Jews, to cast out of their synagogues, such as they thought in manners, or doctrine, contagious. 
as lepers were by the law of Moses separated from the congregation of Israel, till such time as they should be by the priest pronounced clean. The Use of Excommunication Without Civil Power The use and effect of excommunication, whilst it was not yet strengthened with the civil power, was no more than that they, who were not excommunicate, were to avoid the company of them that were. It was not enough to repute them as heathen, that never had been Christians, for with such they might eat, and drink, which with excommunicate persons they might not do. As appeareth by the words of St. Paul, 1 Cor. 5, version 9, 10, and c where he telleth them, he had formerly forbidden them to company with fornicators. But, because that could not be without going out of the world, he restraineth it to such fornicators, and otherwise vicious persons, as were of the brethren. With such a one, he saith, they ought not to keep company, no, not to eat. And this is no more than our Savior saith, Matt. 18.17 Let him be to thee as a heathen, and as a publican. For publicans, which signifieth farmers, and receivers of the revenue of the commonwealth, were so hated, and detested by the Jews that were to pay for it, as that publican and sinner were taken amongst them for the same thing. Insomuch, as when our Savior accepted the invitation of Zacchaeus a publican, though it were to convert him, yet it was objected to him as a crime. And therefore, when our Savior, to heathen, added publican, he did forbid them to eat with a man excommunicate. As for keeping them out of their synagogues, or places of assembly, they had no power to do it, but that of the owner of the place, whether he were Christian, or heathen. And because all places are by right, in the dominion of the commonwealth. As well he that was excommunicated, as he that never was baptized, might enter into them by commission from the civil magistrate. As Paul before his conversion entrade into their synagogues at Damascus, Acts 9.2, to apprehend Christians, men and women, and to carry them bound to Jerusalem, by commission from the high priest. Of no effect upon an apostate. By which it appears, that upon a Christian, that should become an apostate, in a place where the civil power did persecute, or not assist the church, the effect of excommunication had nothing in it. Neither of damage in this world, nor of terror, not of terror, because of their unbelief, nor of damage, because they returned thereby into the favor of the world. And in the world to come, were to be in no worse estate than they which never had believed. The damage redoubted rather to the church, by provocation of them they cast out, to a freer execution of their malice. But upon the faithful only. Excommunication therefore had its effect only upon those, that believed that Jesus Christ was to come again in glory, to reign over, and to judge both the quick, and the dead. And should therefore refuse entrance into his kingdom, to those whose sins were retained, that is, to those that were excommunicated by the church. And thence it is that St. Paul calleth excommunication, a delivery of the excommunicate person to Satan. For without the kingdom of Christ, all other kingdoms after judgment, are comprehended in the kingdom of Satan. This is it that the faithful stood in fear of, as long as they stood excommunicate, that is to say, in an estate wherein their sins were not forgiven. Whereby we may understand, that excommunication in the time that Christian religion was not authorized by the civil power, was used only for a correction of manners, not of air hours and opinion. For it is a punishment, whereof none could be sensible but such as believed, and expected the coming again of our Savior to judge the world. And they who so believed, needed no other opinion, but only uprightness of life, to be saved. For what fault lieth excommunication? There lieth excommunication for injustice, as Matt. 18. If thy brother offend thee, tell it him privately, then with witnesses, lastly, tell the church. And then if he obey not, let him be to thee as an heathen man, and a publican. And there lieth excommunication for a scandalous life, as one cor. 5. 11. If any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such a one year not to eat, but to excommunicate a man that held this foundation, that Jesus was the Christ, for difference of opinion in other points. By which that foundation was not destroyed, there appeareth no authority in the scripture, nor example in the apostles. There is indeed in St. Paul, Titus 3.10. A text that seemeth to be to the contrary. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. For an heretic is he that being a member of the church, teacheth nevertheless some private opinion. 
which the church has forbidden, and such a one, s. Paul adviseth Titus, after the first and second admonition, to reject. But to reject, in this place, is not to excommunicate the man, but to give over admonishing him, to let him alone, to set by disputing with him, as one that is to be convinced only by himself. The same apostle saith to Tim. 2.23 Foolish and unlearned questions avoid. The word avoid in this place, and reject in the former, is the same in the origin all, paredu, but foolish questions may be set by without excommunication. And again, Title 3.93 Avoid foolish questions, where the origin all, periasteso, set them by, is equivalent to the former word reject. There is no other place that can so much as colorably be drawn to countenance the casting out of the church faithful men, such as believe the foundation. Only for a singular superstructure of their own, proceeding perhaps from a good and pious conscience. But on the contrary, all such places as command avoiding such disputes are written for a lesson to pastors, such as Timothy and Titus were, not to make new articles of faith. By determining every small controversy, which oblige men to a needless burthen of conscience, or provoke them to break the union of the church, which lesson the apostles themselves observed well. S. Peter and S. Paul, though their controversy were great, as we may read in Gal 2.11, yet they did not cast one another out of the church. Nevertheless, during the apostles' time, there were other pastors that observed it not, as Diatrephs, 3 John 9. And who cast out of the church, such as S. John himself thought fit to be received into it, out of a pride he took in preeminence. So early it was, that vainglory and ambition had found entrance into the Church of Christ. Of persons liable to excommunication. That a man be liable to excommunication, there be many conditions requisite. As first, that he be a member of some commonalty, that is to say, of some lawful assembly, that is to say, of some Christian church. That hath power to judge of the cause for which he is to be excommunicated. For where there is no community, there can be no excommunication, nor where there is no power to judge, can there be any power to give sentence. From hence it followeth, that one church cannot be excommunicated by another. For either they have a qual power to excommunicate each other, in which case excommunication is not discipline, nor an act of authority, but schism and dissolution of charity. Or one is so subordinate to the other, as that they both have but one voice, and then they be but one church. And the part excommunicated is no more a church, but a dissolute number of individual persons. And because the sentence of excommunication importeth an advice not to keep company, nor so much as to eat with him that is excommunicate, if a sovereign prince or assembly be excommunicate, the sentence is of no effect. For all subjects are bound to be in the company and presence of their own sovereign, when he requireth it, by the law of nature. Nor can they lawfully either expel him from any place of his own dominion, whether profane or holy, nor go out of his dominion, without his leave. Much less, if he call them to that honor, refuse to eat with him. And as to other princes and states, because they are not parts of one and the same congregation, they need not any other sentence to keep them from keeping company with the state excommunicate. For the very institution, as it uniteth many men into one community, so it dissociateth one community from another, so that excommunication is not needful for keeping kings and states asunder. Nor has any further effect than is in the nature of policy itself, unless it be to instigate princes to war upon one another. Nor is the excommunication of a Christian subject that obeyeth the laws of his own sovereign, whether Christian or heathen, of any effect. For if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, he hath the Spirit of God, 1 Joe. For point 1. And God dwelleth in him, and he in God, 1 Joe. For point 1. 5. But he that hath the Spirit of God, he that dwelleth in God, he in whom God dwelleth, can receive no harm by the excommunication of men. Therefore, he that believeth Jesus to be the Christ, is free from all the dangers threnad to persons excommunicate. He that believeth it not, is no Christian. Therefore a true and unfeigned Christian is not liable to excommunication. Nor he also that is a professed Christian, till his hypocrisy appear in his manners, that is, till his behavior be contrary to the law of his sovereign, which is the rule of manners, and which Christ and his apostles have commanded us to be subject to.
For the church cannot judge of manners, but by external actions, which actions can never be unlawful, but when they are against the law of the commonwealth. If a man's father, or mother, or master be excommunicate, yet are not the children forbidden to keep them company, nor to eat with them. For that were, for the most part, to oblige them not to eat at all, for want of means to get food. And to authorize them to disobey their parents and masters, contrary to the precept of the apostles. In summit, the power of excommunication cannot be extended further than to the end for which the apostles and pastors of the church have their commission from our Savior, which is not to rule by command and coaction, but by teaching and direction of men in the way of salvation in the world to come. And as a master in any science may abandon his scholar when he obstinately neglected the practice of his rules, but not accuse him of injustice because he was never bound to obey him. So a teacher of Christian doctrine may abandon his disciples that obstinately continue in an unchristian life. But he cannot say, they do him wrong, because they are not obliged to obey him. For to a teacher that shall so complain, may be applied the answer of God to Samuel in the like place, 1 Sam. 8. They have not rejected thee, but me. Excommunication therefore when it wanteth the assistance of the civil power, as it doth, when a Christian state or princes excommunicate by a foreign authority, is without effect, and consequently ought to be without terror. The name of Fulman excommunicationist, that is, the thunderbolt of excommunication, proceeded from an imagination of the Bishop of Rome, which first used it, that he was king of kings. As the heathen made Jupiter king of the gods, and assigned him in their poems and pictures a thunderbolt, wherewith to subdue and punish the giants that should dare to deny his power which imagination was grounded on two air hours. 1. That the kingdom of Christ is of this world, contrary to our Savior's own words, my kingdom is not of this world. The other, that he is Christ's vicar, not only over his own subjects, but over all the Christians of the world. Whereof there is no ground in Scripture, and the contrary shall be proved in its due place. Of the interpreter of the Scriptures before civil sovereigns became Christians, St. Paul coming to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, Act 17.2, 3, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Opening and knowledging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom he preached was the Christ. The Scriptures here mentioned were the Scriptures of the Jews, that is, the Old Testament. The men, to whom he was to prove that Jesus was the Christ, and risen again from the dead, were also Jews, and did believe already, that they were the word of God. Hereupon, as it is verse 4, some of them believed, and, as it is in the 5, ver, some believed not. What was the reason, when they all believed the scripture, that they did not all believe alike, but that some approved, others disapproved the interpretation of St. Paul that cited them? And everyone interpreted them to himself? It was this, s. Paul came to them without any legal commission, and in the manner of one that would not command, but persuade. Which he must needs do, either by miracles, as Moses did to the Israelites in Egypt, that they might see his authority in God's works. Or by reasoning from the already received scripture, that they might see the truth of his doctrine in God's word. But whosoever persuadeth by reasoning from principles written, mocketh him to whom he speaketh judge, both of the meaning of those principles, and also of the force of his inferences upon them. If these Jews of Thessalonica were not, who else was the judge of what s? Paul alleged out of scripture. If s? Paul, what needed he to quote any places to prove his doctrine? It had been enough to have said, I find it so in scripture, that is to say, in your laws, of which I am interpreter, as sent by Christ. The interpreter therefore of the scripture, to whose interpretation the Jews of Thessalonica were bound to stand, could be none. Every one might believe, or not believe, according as the allegations seemed to himself to be agreeable, or not agreeable to the meaning of the places all etched. And generally in all cases of the world, he that pretendeth any proof, mocketh judge of his proof him to whom he addresseth his speech. And as to the case of the Jews in particular, they were bound by express words, D-U-T. 17. To receive the determination of all hard questions, from the priests and judges of Israel for the time being. But this is to be understood of the Jews that were yet unconverted. For the conversion of the Gentiles, 
there was no use of all edging the scriptures, which they believed not. The apostles therefore labored by reason to confute their idolatry, and that done, to persuade them to the faith of Christ, by their testimony of his life and resurrection. So that there could not yet be any controversy concerning the authority to interpret scripture. Seeing no man was obliged during his infidelity to follow any man's interpretation of any scripture except his sovereign's interpretation of the laws of his Count Ray. Let us now consider the conversion itself and see what there was therein that could be cause of such an obligation. Men were converted to no other thing than to the belief of that which the apostles preached. And the apostles preached nothing but that Jesus was the Christ, that is to say, the King that was to save them and reign over them eternally in the world to come. And consequently that he was not dead, but risen again from the dead, and gone up into heaven, and should come again one day to judge the world, which also should rise again to be judged, and reward every man according to his works. None of them preached that himself, or any other apostle was such an interpreter of the scripture, as all that became Christians, ought to take their interpretation for law. For to interpret the laws is part of the administration of a present kingdom, which the apostles had not. They prayed then, and all other pastors ever since, let thy kingdom come, and exhorted their converts to obey their then ethnic princes. The New Testament was not yet published in one body. Every of the evangelists was interpreter of his own gospel, and every apostle of his own epistle, and of the Old Testament, our Savior himself saith to the Jews, John 5. 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think to have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. If he had not meant they should interpret them, he would not have bidden them take thence the proof of his being the Christ. He would either have interpreted them himself, or referred them to the interpretation of the priests. When a difficulty arose, the apostles and elders of the church assembled themselves together and determined what should be preached and taught, and how they should interpret the scriptures to the people, but took not from the people the liberty to read and interpret them to themselves. The apostles sent divers letters to the churches and other writings for their instruction, which had been in vain if they had not allowed them to interpret, that is, to consider the meaning of them. And as it was in the apostles' time, it must be till such time as there should be pastors that could authorize an interpreter whose interpretation should generally be stood to. But that could not be till kings were pastors, or pastors kings, of the power to make scripture law. There be two senses wherein a writing may be said to be canonical, for canon signifieth a rule, and a rule is a precept, by which a man is guided, and directed in any action whatsoever. Such precepts, though given by a teacher to his disciple, or a counselor to his friend, without power to compel him to observe them, are nevertheless canons. Because they are rules, but when they are given by one, whom he that receiveth them is bound to obey, then are those canons not only rules, but laws. The question therefore here is of the power to make the scriptures, which are the rules of Christian faith, laws. Of the Ten Commandments. That part of the scripture, which was first law, was the Ten Commandments, written in two tables of stone, and delivered by God himself to Moses, and by Moses made known to the people. Before that time there was no written law of God, who as yet having not chosen any people to be his peculiar kingdom, had given no law to men, but the law of nature, that is to say, the precepts of natural reason, written in every man's own heart. Of these two tables, the first conineth the law of sovereignty. 1. That they should not obey, nor honor the gods of other nations, in these words, non habibus deos alienos corami, that is, thou shalt not have for gods, the gods that other nations worship. But only me, whereby they were forbidden to obey, or honor, as their king and governor, any other god, than him that spake unto them then by Moses and afterwards by the high priest. 2. That they should not make any image to represent him. That is to say, they were not to choose to themselves, neither in heaven nor in earth, any representative of their own fancying, but obey Moses and Aaron, whom he had appointed to that office. 3. That they should not take the name of God in vain, that is, they should not speak rashly of their king, nor dispute his right, nor the commissions of Moses and Aaron, his lieutenants. 4. That they should every seventh day abstain from their ordinary labor and employ that time in doing him public honor. The second table condemneth the duty of one man towards another, as to honor parents, not to kill, 
not to commit adultery, not to steal, not to corrupt judgment by false witness. And finally, not so much as to design in their heart the doing of any injury one to another. The question now is, who it was that gave to these written tables the obligatory force of loss? There is no doubt but that they were made laws by God himself. But because a law obliges not, nor is law to any, but to them that acknowledge it to be the act of the sovereign. How could the people of Israel that were forbidden to approach the mountain to hear what God said to Moses, be obliged to obedience to all those laws which Moses propounded to them? Some of them were indeed the laws of nature, as all the second table, and therefore to be acknowledged for God's laws. Not to the Israelites alone, but to all people, but of those that were peculiar to the Israelites, as those of the first table, the question remains. Saving that they had obliged themselves, presently after the propounding of them, to obey Moses, in these words, Exodus 20.19, Speak them thou to us, and we will hear thee. But let not God speak to us, lest we die. It was therefore only Moses then, and after him the high priest, whom, by Moses, God declared should administer this his peculiar kingdom, that had on earth the power to make the short scripture of the Decalogue to be law in the commonwealth of Israel. But Moses, and Aaron, and the succeeding high priest were the civil sovereigns. Therefore hitherto, the canonizing, or making of the scripture law, belonged to the civil sovereign, of the judicial and Levitical law. The judicial law, that is to say, the laws that God prescribed to the magistrates of Israel, for the rule of their administration of justice, and of the sentences, or judgments they should pronounce, and please between man and man. And the Levitical law, that is to say, the rule that God prescribed touching the rites and ceremonies of the priests and Levites, were all delivered to them by Moses only. And therefore also became laws, by virtue of the same promise of obedience to Moses. Whether these laws were then written, or not written, but dictated to the people by Moses, after his forty days being with God in the mount, by word of mouth, is not expressed in the text. But they were all positive laws, and equivalent to Holy Scripture, and made canonical by Moses the civil sovereign. The second law. After the Israelites were come into the plains of Moab over against Jericho, and ready to enter into the land of promise, Moses to the former laws added divers others, which therefore are called Deuteronomy, that is, second laws, and are, as it is written, D-U-T. 29.1 the words of a covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb, for having explained those former laws. In the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, he addeth others, that begin at the twelfth. Cha, and continue to the end of the twenty-six. Of the same book, this law, D-U-T. 27.1 They were commanded to write upon great stones plastered over, at their passing over Jordan, this law also was written by Moses himself in a book and delivered into the hands of the priests and to the elders of Israel, D-U-T. 31.9 And commanded, V-E. 26. To be put in the side of the ark, for in the ark itself was nothing but the Ten Commandments. This was the law, which Moses, Deuteronomy 17.18, commanded the kings of Israel should keep a copy of. And this is the law, which having been long time lost, was found again in the temple in the time of Josiah, and by his authority received for the law of God. But both Moses at the writing, and Josiah at the recovery thereof, had both of them the civil sovereignty. Hitherto therefore the power of making scripture canonical, was in the civil sovereign. Besides this book of the law, there was no other book, from the time of Moses, till after the captivity, received amongst the Jews for the law of God. For the prophets, except a few, lived in the time of the captivity itself, and the rest lived but a little before it, and were so far from having their prophecies generally received for laws, as that their persons were persecuted, partly by false prophets, and partly by the kings which were seduced by them. And this book itself, which was confirmed by Josiah for the law of God, and with it all the history of the works of God, was lost in the captivity and sack of the city of Jerusalem as appears by that of 2 Esdras 14.21. Thy law is burnt, therefore no man knoweth the things that are done of thee, of the works that shall begin. And before the captivity, between the time when the law was lost, which is not mentioned in the scripture, but may probably be thought to be the time of Rehoboam, 
when Shishak king of Egypt took the spoils of the temple, 1 Kings 14.26, in the time of Josiah, when it was found again. They had no written word of God, but ruled according to their own discretion, or by the direction of such, as each of them esteemed prophets. The Old Testament, when made canonical. From whence we may infer, that the scriptures of the Old Testament, which we have at this day, were not canonical, nor a law unto the Jews. Till the renovation of their covenant with God at their return from the captivity and restoration of their commonwealth under Esdras. But from that time forward they were accounted the law of the Jews, and for such translated into Greek by seventy elders of Judea, and put into the library of Ptolemy at Alexandria, and approved for the word of God. Now seeing Esdras was the high priest, and the high priest was their civil sovereign, it is manifest that the scriptures were never made laws, but by the sovereign civil power. The New Testament began to be canonical under Christian sovereigns by the writings of the fathers that lived in the time before that Christian religion was received. And authorized by Constantine the Emperor, we may find that the books we now have of the New Testament were held by the Christians of that time, except a few. In respect of whose paucity the rest were called the Catholic Church and others heretics for the dictates of the Holy Ghost. And consequently for the canon or rule of faith, such was the reverence and opinion they had of their teachers. As generally the reverence that the disciples bear to their first masters, and all manner of doctrine they receive from them, is not small. Therefore there is no doubt, but when S. Paul wrote to the churches he had converted, or any other apostle or disciple of Christ, to those which had then embraced Christ, they received those their writings for the true Christian doctrine. But in that time, when not the power and authority of the teacher, but the faith of the hearer caused them to receive it, it was not the apostles that made their own writings canonical. But every convert made them so to himself. But the question here is not what any Christian made a law or canon to himself, which he might again reject, by the same right he received it. But what was so made a canon to them, as without injustice they could not do anything contrary thereunto? That the New Testament should in this sense be canonical, that is to say, a law in any place where the law of the commonwealth had not made it so, is contrary to the nature of a law. For a law, as hath been already shown, is the commandment of that man, or assembly, to whom we have given sovereign authority, to make such rules for the direction of our actions. As he shall think fit, and to punish us, when we do anything contrary to the same. When therefore any other man shall offer unto us any other rules, which the sovereign ruler hath not prescribed, they are but counsel and advice. Which, whether good or bad, he that is counseled, may without injustice refuse to observe, and when contrary to the laws already established, without injustice cannot observe. How good soever he conceiveth it to be. I say, he cannot in this case observe the same in his actions, nor in his discourse with other men. Though he may without blame believe thee as private teachers, and wish he had the liberty to practice their advice, and that it were publicly received for law. For in turn all faith is in its own nature invisible, and consequently exempted from all humane jurisdiction. Whereas the words, and actions that proceed from it, as breaches of our civil obedience, are injustice both before God and man. Seeing that our Savior hath denied his kingdom to be in this world, seeing he hath said, he came not to judge, but to save the world. He hath not subjected us to other laws than those of the commonwealth, that is, the Jews to the law of Moses, which he saith, Matt. 5. He came not to destroy, but to fulfill, and other nations to the laws of their several sovereigns, and all men to the laws of nature. The observing whereof, both he himself, and his apostles have in their teaching recommended to us, as a necessary condition of being admitted by him in the last day into his eternal kingdom wherein shall be protection, and life everlasting. Seeing then our Savior, and his apostles, left not new laws to oblige us in this world, but new doctrine to prepare us for the next. The books of the New Te Testament, which contain that doctrine, until obedience to them was commanded, by them that God hath given power to on earth to be legislators, were not obligatory canons. That is, laws, but only good, and safe advice for the direction of sinners in the way to salvation, which every man might take, and refuse at his own peril, without injustice. 
Again, our Savior Christ's commission to his apostles and disciples was to proclaim his kingdom, not present, but to come, and to teach all nations, and to baptize them that should believe, and to enter into the houses of them that should receive them, and where they were not received, to shake off the dust of their feet against them. But not to call for fire from heaven to destroy them, nor to compel them to obedience by the sword. In all which there is nothing of power, but of persuasion. He sent them out as sheep unto wolves, not as kings to their subjects. They had not in commission to make laws, but to obey and teach obedience to laws made. And consequently they could not make their writings obligatory canons without the help of the sovereign civil power. And therefore the scripture of the New Testament is their only law, where the lawful civil power hath made it so. And there also the king, or sovereign, mocketh it a law to himself, ah, by which he subjecteth himself, not to the doctor, or apostle, that converted him, but to God himself, and his son Jesus Christ, as immediately as did the apostles themselves. Of the power of counsels to make the scripture law, that which may seem to give the New Testament, in respect of those that have embraced Christian doctrine, the force of laws, and the times, and places of persecution.